Good morning and uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for attending this webinar. Topic of uh, today's presentation is how to structure M&A deals in China. Mergers and acquisitions is the way for many players to establish their presence in China and acquire strategic, uh, tangible or intangible assets, technology, distribution channels, talents, etc. In structuring a cross-border M&A deal, uh, foreign investment enterprises may face numerous challenges. The most common ones are uh, compliance with the uh, Chinese laws and uh, taxation, amongst many others. In the first part of this webinar, uh, Quentin Bottasso, legal consultant for John Loon Law Firm, will introduce the regulatory uh, landscape and how to structure and negotiate a deal, sharing also a, a real-life M&A case. In the second part, I will discuss from a tax perspective the most common tax types and risks in M&A and how to effectively manage them. Finally, there will be a Q&A session. Now let's get started and I give the word to, to you, Quentin. Thank you, Francesca. Um, I, uh, thank you, everybody, for joining this webinar. I'll be covering today the legal aspects of uh, conducting an M&A deal in China. Many thanks again, Francesca, for, for uh, sharing this webinar uh, with Zhonglun, and thanks to the teams at Oxford for, for hosting this webinar and making this partnership possible again. I hope that everybody will learn a great deal through this, uh, this hour we'll spend together. I tried to make uh, this presentation as insightful as I could uh, and putting myself in the audience's shoes, uh, as the audience is composed of law firms, lawyers working in other jurisdictions, legal counsels, some company CEOs, private equity funds, uh, and other people that would be interested in the topic. So, I hope this webinar will, uh, will clarify a few points on the M&A landscape in China. Okay, please allow me to say a few words about Zhonglun. Um, we are a Beijing-based Chinese law firm, and we have 11 offices in mainland China and uh, in seven offices around the world including Hong Kong, SAR, Tokyo, London, New York, San Francisco, Los Angeles, and our newly opened office in uh, Almaty, Kazakhstan. I'm working myself uh, from the Guangzhou office in China, uh, and we cover the whole South China area. Um, of course, the, the practices that we cover include general corporate law, um, cooperation, deregistration, liquidations, contract law, employment matters and labor law in general, intellectual property, commercial litigations, and cross-border transactions, and uh, the topic of today, mergers and acquisitions. You'll find my phone number, email address, and the two QR, QR codes below. The one on the left would be my personal WeChat account, and the one on the right would be um, uh, the Zhonglun official account. You can, can do those and you can, um, you can access our official uh, articles and publications. Okay, let's get into it. So this is the agenda for today. I'll be covering uh, the Chinese regulatory environment uh, in the first part. The second part would be on the what I call the art of the deal, meaning all the variables that you need to take into account when thinking or negotiating a deal with, uh, with a Chinese uh, partner or a Chinese company. We'll also be covering uh, a case study at the end, and I will give the microphone to Francesca after that. Okay, so introdu introducing the topic of M&A. Um, the year 2020 has been a very particular year for China, as at least we can say. Uh, we can say that it started with a little hiccup and finished very strong for the country. 
on the health aspect, uh, China has been first in, first out of the of the uh, COVID-19 epidemic, and we can really sense that uh, nowadays. China will be the only major country with a positive growth in 2020, uh, as it recently declared a 2.3% GDP increase last year. And that's without the quantitative easing that we have witnessed on both, so, both sides of the Atlantic Ocean in Europe and the USA, meaning China is very strong at the moment and it didn't need to uh, create depth for that. China is also at the end of a 40-year trend of economic growth and a multiplication by 30 of the GDP per capita since the mid-1980s. Uh, and those, those few factors I just listed are uh, a decisive uh, indication for foreign investors and, and uh, private equity funds to be very bullish on China at the moment. I know that in the West, we have a lot of bias and prejudice against China because it's a different system, it's a different political environment. It's, we have many differences with China, that's the least we can say. Now, if we look at the country with very clear eyes, we have to witness that um, diversifying with China and in China is definitely a good decision in the future. This is my personal take on it, and uh, it's backed by quite a lot of uh, activity that we've recently seen in China post-COVID-19 epidemic. Generally speaking, when we want to access the Chinese market, we uh, we can see three general ways to, to go about this. The first one would be accessing the Chinese market from outside, meaning uh, I have a company uh, in a certain jurisdiction and I'm trying to do business with China, so I will have sales contracts or purchasing agreements and all of that. I will remain outside of China, meaning I don't have any structure within China. That's the first way. The second way would be greenfield investment, meaning I will set up my own company, I will recruit my own staff in China, and I will basically do everything by myself and build it step by step. That's the second way. And the third way would be mergers and acquisitions. Mergers and acquisitions are basically the way um, for companies who are not willing to uh, take it step by step and want to have exponential growth in China. Uh, finding numbers on m as in China is not the easiest thing, but general trends show that there was an, a very steady growth of m a deals in terms of numbers and volume until 2012. This was the highest number. And then there was a there was a decrease of deals in value and volume um, starting from 2012 until now. Now we tend to be stabilized uh, on what would be a level that represents around half of what it was in 2012. This said, there's still a big volume of deals happening, and at our own scale. Uh, which is not representative of the whole country. Maybe we are we are in a in a very privileged area of the country. We can see that the market of mergers and acquisitions, especially acquisitions, is very strong at the moment post COVID nineteen epidemic. And this is due to the Chinese market's uh, special environment, which is fast, which is very competitive, and very um, internally driven. Meaning the Chinese market is now. Uh, is now a good element for foreign investors to get into the Chinese market. Before, in 2012, it was mostly to acquire manufacturing facilities in order to uh, in order to provide for the European and US market. And now we can see that companies who want to acquire Chinese companies in order to access the Chinese market. So there was a big switch between 2012 and now, and and uh, and this is the. Uh, the most significant uh, thing. Okay, I will be covering um, part one now, the regulatory environment. Any type of foreign investment into China, including M&A of domestic companies, uh, is limited. China has been an entirely planned economy um, starting from 1949, and we can see uh, we can still see a sign of it through the current system in place. 
um, basically the government and the authorities have the power to approve or dismiss foreign investment projects and also Chinese investment projects within China. We have four lists that limit Chinese investment um, applicable to, to uh, foreign companies. The first one would be the special administrative measures on access to foreign investment. The second one would be the general neg negative list, which apply to every entity in China, including, of course, domestic companies. The newer version is from June 2020, and um, every year they just reduce the amount of restriction to access the market. So there's an open up of field of possibilities in China on a yearly basis. There's also the free trade zone special administrative measures on access to foreign investment. Those are applicable only in those special administrative zones. And the fourth one is the catalog for guiding industry restructuring. For the sake of this presentation, we will not be covering the general negative list uh, that applies to all companies in China, foreign and domestic. Same as the uh, free trade zone um, special administrative measures because they are only applicable in uh, in certain areas. And we will not be covering the catalog for guiding industry restructuring, this, which is basically a document that, um, that entered into effect recently on the 1st of January 2020, and is a guideline for local government to push for the improvement of the Chinese economy uh, uh, through the promotion of some industries and through the uh, basically trying to filter some uh, some industries out of the country. Companies, let's say, that are, uh, that are considered in industries that are polluting, harmful for the environment, unnecessary, and so on. Okay. Uh, now, going back to the special administrative measures on access to foreign investment, uh, this list, uh, this list categorizes industries in which foreign investment is subject to special administration administrative measures we have categories that are permitted we have categories that are um, limited and categories that are pro um, prohibited so we, whenever we receive a, an investment project we have to analyze uh, we have to analyze what is their business and what is doable in China and what is not doable in China so we refer to this list for that. Another thing that is necessary in order to operate in the Chinese market are licenses and authorities' approval. approvals. Many industries, foreign and domestic companies, are required to obtain licenses in order to operate. Uh, this is a key issue to anticipate since it is quite common for the regulations to technically allow foreign invested companies in China to obtain the required licenses. but in some cases, and that's why we need to conduct uh, we need to conduct the analysis before the ent the, uh, the entry of the uh, in the market. Licenses can be very hard to obtain in practice for foreign investors. So this is something that needs to be monitored in advance. The requirements in order to obtain licenses may be capital requirements or certain uh, qualifications for the personnel, certain assets or uh, a good track record and a good history of the company abroad that you have to prove to the authorities. This said, again, uh, it's a challenge for foreign companies, but it's also an opportunity for foreign companies, meaning you can have the strategy to enter into the market and acquire a Chinese company for the sake of obtaining the license. Whenever the acquisition will be conducted, the license will need to be renewed, of course, but it's much easier to renew a license than to acquire a license uh, starting from zero. So it can be, uh, this issue can create an opportunity for foreign investors. Regarding authorities' approvals, um, you need to go through a, a list of approvals and a list of, uh, of authorities um, before you can operate your company in China. The China national security law sets in place a uh, sort of a review mechanism for Chinese authority to review investment projects into China. The logic behind it basically is to serve 
as a tool for the for the MOFCOM, the Ministry of uh, of Foreign, the Ministry of Commerce, sorry, to submit any application to the authorities that will then deem acceptable or not acceptable an investment project based on the fact that it may cause a threat to the state's power to govern sovereignty unity and territorial integrity basically uh, in one word they uh, there is a, a a review by the chinese authorities the chinese state on some sensitive industries this is very specific to some industries such as military strategic infrastructure uh, strategic equipment transportation nuclear power energy resources exploitation and and so on and so forth besides this very specific re requirement under the national security law approvals need to be given by uh, other chinese authorities such as the ministry of commerce the ndrc the samr and i don't want to get too much into the details and the technical stuff uh, on this webinar but some further approvals uh, on top of this can be required if, if the company is operating in a specific industry okay now moving on to the second part and i think the most practical practical and the most interesting one uh, for all of you uh, the variables that need to be adjusted when thinking about the deal in china number one is currency currency exchange the Chinese renminbi, the Chinese currency, is not freely convertible, and the currency, uh, currency exchange between USD or, or any currency and and the Chinese Chinese yuan, are monitored by uh, by the SAFE, the SAFE, the State uh, Administration for Foreign Exchange, and the Chinese banks. When a Chinese company is acquired by a foreign investor, the purchase price will be paid in USD, for instance, or euros or any other foreign currency and will be converted by the seller in, in yuan, Chinese yuan under the safe and the bank compliance control. This is something that is uh, to be taken into account. So the, 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 the foreign currency exchange is uh, an issue that can be monitored and a variable for adjustment that needs to be considered in advance. Second variable is the form of companies. The type of companies that are accessible to foreign investors are the wholly foreign owned enterprise, uh, which is a limited liability company that is fully, uh, fully funded by foreign investors. The equity joint venture, uh, the cooperative joint venture, the foreign invested company limited by shares. Those are the four companies that are considered foreign invested enterprises. And Four other investment vehicles are available into the into China under the foreign invested enterprise uh, into the foreign invested enterprise category, which are the representative office. So those companies are not considered domestic companies; they are, they are considered foreign companies. The representative office, the foreign invested partnership, the VIE structure, which is a which is a variable uh, interest entity, a very specific structure of uh, of companies that basically allow a foreign investor to control in fine a chinese company and operate in the chinese market as would uh, as a chinese company would but it's a control mechanism made by contracts that allows for entering into sensitive industries and uh, finally the subsidiary of a foreign invested enterprise the subsidiary of a, of, a, of a Chinese Wufi, for instance, is not considered a foreign invested enterprise. Another aspect that I would like to cover is the difference between asset deal and share deal. The difference between a share transfer and an asset transfer is that the company will eventually, the company that will eventually own the asset is, is either the existing company or, uh, or a new one. The main difference here is that whenever um, whenever an asset deal is conducted, the company that used to own the assets will be uh, will not own the assets anymore or will be dissolved, for instance, and the assets are acquired by a new company. 
on, in a share transfer, only the shareholder will change, meaning the company will keep existing with its debts and liabilities. An asset deal is a fresh start, and a share deal share deal is is taking uh, taking on a project that has been going on previously. Now, the idea of a fresh start may fresh start may be appealing, but the asset deal in China may, may cause a few issues. First issue, for instance, employment. The ex uh, workforce, workforce of the company or staff, the staff that will be kept, uh, will have seniority rights that will need to be compensated before their contract is terminated under the old company and renewed under the new company. So this is one issue. Another issue is you will have to renew all the contracts, um, land contracts, rental contracts, commercial contracts. So all of those makes the asset deal a more complicated uh, process same for intellectual property if you acquire the ip from a company you have to transfer the ip if you just acquire the shares of the company you just acquire the shares and you become the new shareholder and you become the new owner of the ip automatically um, another issue that you can face is that there's a lien relationship between um, for liabilities directly related to the assets so if the assets have associated liabilities, then you become the new owner of the liabilities, unfortunately. So uh, in continuing an asset deal, you can consider it through the idea of acquiring specific assets and not the whole assets of the companies. And in that case, uh, it makes the deal reasonable. If you want to acquire all the assets of a company, let's say the, the, the staff, the intellectual property, the land, the factories or facilities, and so on, you really have to have a good reason for not wanting to do an, a share deal. Otherwise, it's more favorable to go with a share deal. Also, the time frame is very different because um, asset deals usually take, uh, take longer, although the law applies differently. Um, for newly invested, uh, for newly invested companies, the law uh, the law um, requires that the whole asset transfer is happening within one year. So this is something to be taken into account. Another difference and variable that can be adjusted is whether you want to do a partial acquisition or a full acquisition. Partial acquisitions are um, generally not favored by foreign investors because when you acquire a Chinese company, you want to fully control it. You don't necessarily want to have someone uh, with you controlling the company. And generally speaking, uh, corporate governance is very, mo very, uh, very convenient whenever it's in only one pair of hands. When you have two pair of hands controlling a company, it can lead to uh, a lot of problems, obviously. Now, this said, if you, uh, uh, if you consider a partial acquisition, it can be for a few reasons. For instance, um, if, it, if an old company is heavily managed by one specific person and you want to keep the person on board, let's say he's an inventor or he's someone with special uh, special talents or someone with a very big distribution network, uh, it can be a good idea to partially acquire shares of his company and not kick the person out. This could be a, a very viable strategy. And in, in this sense, it makes sense to go for a partial acquisition. Uh, partial acquisitions also do make sense in the context of newly issued equity in a company. The company has a, a, a capital of, let's say, 100, and they uh, they issue equity for another 100, and the new 100 will be acquired by another company, and then uh, it's considered a partial acquisition. This is the case if a, co a company needs uh, liquidities in order to develop themselves into a new project. So this is something to to consider. 
Another variable that needs to be adjusted is the question of what is being acquired in the new company. Do we acquire uh, the IP of a company? Do we acquire the trademarks of a company? Or do we acquire the people within the company? The sales team, the fund manager, and so on. And based on that, the next question is how do we structure the payment? The two deals, let's say you want to acquire the IP and let's say you want to acquire the people, the two deals are very different. Um, in the sense that the first the first case scenario is you acquire the IP. If you just acquire the IP, it makes sense to pay in a lump sum investment. You just pay immediately uh, an agreed price after the appraisal. The appraisal company says uh, says this is the value, and the investors uh, agree to uh, move around the numbers and agree on the number. Uh, and everything is paid into a lump sum investment. So that's uh, that's one possibility. Now, if you want to keep the people in the company, especially the, the, the higher management and the founder or, um, or let's say the, 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 the CTO, the CFO, the COO, or, or the, the higher management, it makes sense to structure the payment with a bonus. The bonus structure will definitely increase the equity value in the sense that the retention rate will be definitely much higher than when you just, uh, you just pay everything in a lump sum payment, and um, that's that moves us to the to the to the next aspect. Um, as I mentioned, the people that are likely to stay in the company post acquisition are likely to be um, to be downgraded in a way because you will certainly bring new staff in the company, and the emotional aspect of that needs to be taken into account when acquiring a, a Chinese company. This is something that is very, um, very practical and very real, and that we see on every acquisition. Um, whenever someone gets wealthier after an acquisition, it's much harder to retain them, obviously, for very practical reasons as well. This forces investors and uh, and us, the, the legal advisors, to be creative when structuring the deal and uh, addressing those issues very early on. Um, most founders in China are not the Silicon Valley type, uh, at least not yet. Uh, the idea of funding a company for the sake of selling it to foreign investors in China is, uh, is, is not very common at all. In those cases, in the case where uh, a person has uh, taken uh, a great deal of, of his life and his resources to build up a company, the earnout model is more appropriate as it keeps potential shareholder involved in the life of the company post acquisition and this is the value that you want to retain whenever you acquire a chinese company um, next part i called it avoiding breaking the deal what i mean by that is uh, that shareholders and the ex executive director or the board of executive uh, yeah the board of uh, the board of the executive director can break the deal in a few ways if the target if the target company is a Chinese limited liability company or, or a foreign, uh, foreign, wholly foreign owned enterprise, a WUFI, or a, a company limited by shares, the shareholders in, uh, in proportion to their equity can vote in the shareholders meeting. According to the Chinese company law, the decision for a company to increase or decrease its capital or, or uh, amend the articles of association and the mergers or restructuring of the company is subject to the approval by Two third of the of the shareholders meeting. In other words, a minority shareholder that that holds more than thirty three percent of the shares may have a de facto veto power on the deal. Talking about the right to have a veto on the implementation of an MA, it is possible for shareholders for the shareholders agreement to include such. Um, Meaning, when you consider acquiring a Chinese company, you have to take into account that someone that holds more than 33% of the equity uh, in the company can break the deal. And if there's a shelled uh, agreement that has been uh, signed and implemented, uh, it's important to have a look at this because uh, a clause in this shareholder agreement can really break the deal. Okay, another aspect that I would like to cover is the seller's 
the buyer side and the seller side. There's generally two approaches that are uh, that are happening in in a, in a merger and acquisition deal. Either the target is trying to sell, meaning they are proactively looking for investors or, or buyers, or the buyer is shopping around and finding someone that never asked to be bought in the first place. For those uh, for those second types, uh, meaning someone, uh, a foreign investor is shopping around for a company, it's good to, uh, in my experience, uh, to uh, go with a very uh, long-term approach and not immediately start with talking about acquiring the company. A good way to think about this is actually to initiate the process through phases let's say uh, uh, an initial collaboration for some time and uh, and then um, taking some equity in the company if the if the uh, if the uh, collaboration works properly or uh, doing an asset swap for instance that could be also a good approach and then down the line talk about an acquisition uh, it's good to go with a very slow approach and and try not to rush things and it's it's also going to be reflected on the price of the acquisition if the buyer uh, is actually uh, shopping around, it's also good to negotiate early on an exclusivity for the negotiation. The exclusivity can be for, let's say, 100 and, or let's say 90 days, um, but usually from our experience, it's always renewed, uh, except it's not good to go with an approach and say, can we negotiate an exclusivity for, for two years? It doesn't make any sense, but... Uh, in in, uh, in most cases, this is uh, what may happen. Another issue is uh, compliance. A due diligence in China, uh, at least for the legal side, is usually, uh, let's say, messier and more challenging than in developed markets. In those cases, the trust that needs to be uh, that needs to be established between the uh, the investor and the legal team is even more important because a good sh a good share of what we gain uh, on inf on the information of the company is based on the declaration of the shareholder and the staff and also the the, the database the judgment of the legal team is, is, is absolutely the most important thing. Um, the ability for the legal team to, um, to draw the line between something that not, doesn't need to worry the investor and something that is a red flag is based on the judgment of the lawyer and the, uh, and the legal team. It's even more true with the current situation where it's much harder to cross borders. And we had a few cases of, uh, of lack of trust because, because the investor couldn't travel and couldn't actually see what's the company looking like, looking like and what, what are the documents and meeting the person face to face and asking the questions. And this is why the ability for the legal advisor to make a difference between what is a low what is a low risk what is a medium risk what is a high risk and what is a red flag is even more important and this is also why uh, the fact that it's much it's let's say differently organized in chinese companies is also what makes it for great opportunities because an, a company that is not very strictly organized is a company with which you can definitely uh, agree on a lower price because the risk is higher, higher risk, potentially greater opportunities. And this is also why, uh, and this will be the, uh, the last remark of, of part two before we move to the, to the case study. This is why uh, foreign invested enterprises into China are definitely targets of choice for foreign investors looking to get into the Chinese market. Acquiring a company that has been managed by someone from your nationality or your, uh, your area is generally speaking, makes things much, much easier. So if you are a, uh, 
a general manager of a, of a Chinese comp uh, of a Wufi in China, a foreign invested enterprise into China, consider that you are a target of choice for many foreign investors that look to get, that are looking to get into the Chinese market. Now moving on to the case study, which will be my last um, last part of my speech. Uh, I would like to go through this quite quickly because the time is running out. Um, the buyer was a French mid-market private equity firm. The seller was uh, the Chinese distributor of a company. Basically, um, basically the, the, the PE firm acquired a group of companies. And within this group, there was one specific company that produces very, ha very high-end machinery produced in Europe and sold in China. Um, and they had a Chinese distributor for that. The Chinese distributor was a, a Wufi that was foreign managed in South China. Uh, it was managed by uh, by someone from Asia, but not uh, not China. Another another highly developed country in uh, in in Asia. The deal happened during the COVID nineteen pandemic. Even though they were in the negotiation for the deal to happen for the past two years. The general manager, who was also the founder of the company, had been working in this company for more than 20 years. So he was very invested invested into this company and was uh, out of, let's say, out of the out of the company for for uh, a few months. Slowly, he was uh, looking to retire, and for those reasons, he was really a target of choice. The deal was a 100% share acquisition and. Um, and it happened during the again the COVID nineteen pandemic. The whole process took around seven months, um, with quite a few issues along the way. But um, the, the conclusion of this of this case study is that it was a good upside for both parties, meaning the private equity firm will be in uh, three, four, five years down the line able to resell. The French company, together with its Chinese distributor, and they also uh, targeted distributors in other jurisdictions such as Brazil, Russia, USA. So they were uh, acquiring their distributors slowly in order to resell the company, the, the French company, uh, in a package with four or five distributors in other jurisdictions, which, as you can imagine, is a very different, uh, a different appraisal compared to just one company with. Uh, outside distributors. So this concludes my presentation. I will uh, give the microphone back to Francesca. Thank you very much, Quentin, for your uh, your presentation. Um, okay, uh, a very brief uh, introduction. Uh, my name is uh, Francesca Scortichini, and I'm a senior, uh, an associate director at um, at Oxford. Oxford is a company specialized in providing services and advisory for inbound investments to Asia. <clears throat> We serve uh, more than uh, 1,000 multinational companies in different industries uh, with a global team of um, 250 people speaking multiple languages and uh, provide a comprehensive package of services, um, including uh, market entry advisory, corporate accounting, tax, um, human resources, uh, as well as um, tailor-made solutions for different needs. We have uh, offices uh, in China, including Shanghai, Changshu, Beijing, Guangzhou, and Shenzhen, and also in Hong Kong, Singapore, Jersey, London, and Milan. Okay. Um, in Oxford, we have a consolidated experience in uh, assisting clients in the retail industry, uh, mainly European brands of fashion and luxury retail. 
In years, we have seen a trend in this industry where the distribution model has evolved into direct retail. Years ago, uh, many brands were adopting a so-called principal distributor approach where the principal, the brand, um, would not have a direct presence in China or engage in direct operations. They would simply sell their products to the local distributors that would open and manage the stores on behalf of the brand. Then, as the industry and the opportunities were growing, brands started to establish their direct presence in China uh, through a joint venture uh, with a local partner or a wholly owned foreign company. Therefore, many brands uh, had to acquire the shops uh, and assets uh, from uh, their distributors that in the meantime had opened several shops in various cities or they had to buy back the equity from the joint venture partner. <clears throat> in conclusion, Despite now the consolidated model for retail companies is more a direct entry in the, in the market, we still see many changes in the industry. Acquisitions from other brands, restructuring, reorganizations, and indirect equity transfer that are indeed very, very common. In the next section, um, I will present, uh, I will discuss um, m a from uh, from a, um, a taxation point of view. Um, ta taxation in m a is uh, one of the major cost considerations for investors and it can involve a lot of tax types such as um, enterprise income tax, um, which is the most common type. Uh, individual income tax for individuals and others uh, like uh, VAT, land appreciation tax, um, deed tax, uh, uh, stamp duty. It depends on the nature of the transaction. Here below, uh, we have listed some examples. Normally, the equity would definitely be involved in a, an M&A transaction, but also tangible assets such as land, um, machines, goods, or intangible assets like uh, trademark, uh, patents, um, etc. For each different type of transfer, we can make different tax uh, uh, considerations. Here, I will introduce just the most common ones uh, to give you a general idea. Uh, this topic is so vast and complex that uh, it would be impossible to cover all the aspects in a few minutes. So feel free to reach us um, after this webinar for, for more information or clarifications. For a transfer of equity, we would have to consider whether it is a case where a general tax treatment is applicable or a special tax treatment. What does it mean a special tax treatment for EIT? That you can defer the tax payment. So you don't have to pay immediately, but you can defer the tax payment in the future when you will transfer the equity again. There are a lot of requirements uh, to be met to enjoy the special tax treatment, and um, this is a subject uh, case by case. For transfer of listed company, companies, uh, the VAT and stamp duty will also be involved, as um, these will be considered a transfer of uh, financial assets. But otherwise, VAT is not involved. Speaking of um, intangible assets, we always face the difficulty of uh, assessing the right value or justify the market value of intangible assets, um, such as um, technology, patent rights, trademark, copyrights, um, etc. They, they are all subject to different evaluation methods, uh, case by case. But 
the investors the, the investors need to consider what type of intangible assets they are acquiring uh, because uh, the value of the intangible assets would affect the value of the transaction, hence the related taxation. Then there is the transfer of assets such as goods, non-movable assets, uh, um, machineries. VAT can be involved, but it can also be deferred subject to the so-called TOGC, transfer of going concern. That means the continuity of the business after the transfer. And similarly to the special tax treatment, you will have to meet a lot of requirements to enjoy uh, the defer deferral. One of the major requirements is that uh, when you transfer the equity or assets, you are promising that you don't sell this equity within a certain period and you will continue the same business. So this is one of the major conditions that needs to, me, to be met. When, when you transfer land, property rights, buildings, the deed tax and land appreciation tax will be involved as well. So you can see in, that China has a lot of different taxes that can be involved uh, depending on different situations. There are a lot of tax considerations in M&A that uh, the investors should be aware of when uh, acquiring a target company in China. I'm just uh, listing some of them. For example, the holding structure of the target company. How, how the holding structure looks like currently and what happens if we invest or merge these companies? Would the merge change the current operations and the existing transactions? After the acquisition, would the dividends or interest royalties be paid to other countries? That may have an impact under a different uh, double taxation agreement, um, if there is one. Then um, you will have to consider whether the M&A would make an impact on the current tax incentives, uh, such as a uh, deferred tax. As we said before, if the target is not selling the equities, uh, it may be subject to a special tax treatment um, that their uh, tax payment can be deferred, but would our M&A break that rules and then become a taxable tra transaction? Is the M&A affecting any tax incentive the company is actually enjoying? This is also something we want to understand before uh, the M&A. Disclosure of indirect, indirect share transfer and related detection risk. The, the indirect share transfer is actually very common and uh, may not be visible to tax authorities in China. An indirect share transfer is when the merger happens outside of China, but involves an underlying asset or entity in China. For example, a company A based in UK acquires a company B in Singapore that has a subsidiary in China. Therefore, company A is acquiring a company in China through Singapore without any formal transaction happening in China. An indirect share transfer may or may not trigger taxation in China. It depends. Also, at the same time, there is no mandatory disclosure of an indirect share transfer in China, but there is a detection risk whether the China Tax Bureau will spot the transaction and deem it to be a taxable transaction. Lastly, the tax cost estimation on the exit phase. So we, we will also have to think about the future. If uh, there would be an exit from uh, the investment in China, 
when we will try to sell this equity, we need to consider the related tax implication when exit China. This is a very common consideration for private equity firms, for example, but not only. There, there may be lo lots of tax risks um, associated with your target company in China. For example, transfer pricing risks. Um, if the target company has been involved in cross-border related party transactions, you may have to check whether they have a proper transfer price, pricing policy um, or all the documents prepared are in compliance with the local tax authorities. Now, the transfer pricing um, is definitely a focus of the authorities in China in the attempt to avoid the profit shifting and uh, keep the taxation in the same country. Or um, a permanent establishment risk of non-Chinese target companies outside of China or in China it is also definitely one point that needs to be checked. For example, some target companies with business operations in China provide actual services within a certain period through the personnel of the target company or have fixed business premises or carried out business negotiations or sign overseas contract in China. So, so you may have to check the status uh, as uh, you, you maybe are acquiring a company with a, a permanent establishment risk and may have to pay taxes in China. Then uh, a general tax compliance risk. Uh, this is simply if the target company is filing and paying their tax properly. This would be checked during the tax due diligence. The risk of failing to, uh, to make tax deduction. Similarly, as above, uh, we need to check that the tax deductions can be made, uh, but lots of companies may not have a proper financial department in China. So th they may have a disadvantage due to the failure to properly keep the necessary supporting documents uh, that are necessary to support the tax deduction, such as um, invoices, payment records, contracts, etc. Another aspect is um, accounting compliance. It, it may happen that the target company compiles multiple sets of accounts and uses the accounts with less profits for tax declaration to reduce the tax burden. This shall be checked during the tax due diligence as well to assess whether the company is using accounting schemes to avoid taxation. Or it can happen the target company is deliberately declaring assets or goods imported into China at lower prices to pay lower import tax, such as VAT, consumption tax and tariff. These are just uh, examples to, to check uh, whether the, the, the target company has been uh, incompliant in tax uh, during the transfer of goods or accounting bookkeeping, etc. And then there is also another risk that is um, whether uh, any tax incentive have been obtained um, preparing false documents. What can, what can our investors actually do? We, we, we understand that during the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, it has been a challenge for the tax due diligence team to, that usually should go uh, inside to do investigations um, on the Chinese target uh, due to the travel restrictions, time or budget limitations. So that result to, to have 
less or limited information sometimes on the target company. So in such situation, there are some ways for, for, for the investors to deal with, with that if uh, they, they find some kind of uncertain issues or risks still unsolved or unclear. For example, uh, to lower the purchase price or to negotiate and include protective clauses in the special purchase agreement to ensure they are protected during the M&A or to amend the deal structure such as um, change the timeline of the deal or purchase a partial equity instead of a total, total purchase of equity, etc. Uh, or in the end, even shut down the deal uh, until the target company resolves those issues. In conclusion, what are our suggestions? Mm, professional tax support is uh, definitely uh, what we strongly suggest during the different stages of the M&A pre-transaction, during transaction, as well as after transaction. During phase one, um, we will have to plan ahead, as we spoke earlier, what kind of assets we are transferring and the related taxation. Also, a tax optimization plan is suggested to ensure you are not overpaying your tax during the M&A. Um, in phase two, during, during the transaction execution stage, we will um, perform the tax due diligence, uh, we will identify all the tax risks, analyze the tax impact and obtain the information needed for the tax framework planning. We will do the tax structure planning to ensure efficiency before and after the M&A. We would also predict the cash flow impact of the related tax cost. We would review the equity transfer agreement for the investor to ensure all the clauses are protective enough. And we also, we, we also have to ensure all the tax documents and the handover job have been done properly because after the transfer, a lot of the tax works will need to be carried out by the buyer. And we need to ensure a smooth transfer during the handover. There should be a list of all the tax work they are currently doing and what is the plan after. During the last phase, the transaction effectiveness, we will have to ensure that the implementation of the transfer is completed and uh, eventually solve problems um, mm, happening after the transactions. For example, the tax bureau may not understand the transaction well and we may need to provide supporting documents, explanations and make sure the transaction is concluded with no problem. This is uh, the conclusion of um, my part of the presentation. We understand you may still have a lot of uh, questions or points to clarify. As I said before, this uh, topic is maybe one of the most complex uh, from legal and tax point of view. So the, the aim of uh, this presentation was uh, to give you just a general idea and some uh, key takeaways. We are happy to, to reply to your questions, so please feel free to contact us via email uh, um, and uh, you can find uh, our contact uh, here. Now we still have some time so we can open the Q&A session. We have already received a couple of questions. So the first one is, in an indirect equity transfer of Chinese equity, I understand there is no reporting obligation. 
how should investors determine and reconcile the conflict from the buyer and the seller perspective? As we said before, indirect transfer of shares are very, very common. There is a famous announcement, uh, uh, number seven of uh, 2015, that stipulates that both parties of uh, an indirect uh, transfer transaction have no legal reporting obligation for the transaction. So the buyer and the seller, they, they have to choose whether to report to the tax authorities or not. What does it mean? Um, reporting is not mandatory, but there is a detection risk. Uh, so that means there is a risk to be checked by the tax authorities and found to be a taxable transaction. So in practice, the buyer and the seller often have a different views um, and the considerations about whether to perform the reporting work or not. For, for those transactions that both parties consider to have a reasonable commercial purposes, meaning those transactions that not, does not trigger taxation in China, the seller would probably not want to report the transaction as it will not bring adverse consequences to the seller. And um, the seller will always uh, often focus on uh, the information disclosure problems, potential uncertainty, and maybe the impact of the disclosure um, on the tran transaction schedule. But at the same time, Reporting the deal will be beneficial uh, for the buyer, uh, at least in three ways. First of all, according to the announcement uh, uh, number seven we mentioned before, the buyer's liability for failing to fulfill the obligation of uh, withholding tax can be reduced or exempted in principle after timely performing the first stage of the reporting work. Second, um, reporting the transaction will help the buyer to determine the transfer cost when the, the, the equity will, will be sold in the future. And lastly, uh, now the tax authorities have strengthened the supervision of indirect transfer transactions. So once the tax authorities pay attention to the indirect transfer of equity, they can often ask the target company to provide information related to the indirect transfer. So since the equity transfer is already completed uh, um, and part of the information is in the hands of the original seller, it will cause an additional workload for the buyer to report uh, um, to, to do the reporting work after some time the transaction happened. So because of the above mentioned conflicts of interest in practice, most sellers tend not to report the transaction to the tax authorities, the, um, for, obviously for those transactions that both parties consider to have reasonable commercial purposes. However, we would definitely recommend the buyers to report the transaction for the sake of protecting, uh, of protecting their own interests. In addition, most of the buyers uh, can also reserve part of their equity transfer price as a, the, as a tax provision to fully protect their, um, their own interests. The conflict this conflict between buyer and seller can also lead to different positions uh, during the negotiation. And uh, based on that, they can also draft the terms of the equity agreement, um, the transfer equity agreement uh, accordingly. On the other hand, for those uh, transactions that are considered taxable in China, both parties uh, usually agree 
to perform the reporting work uh, and then to complete the tax uh, declaration process. At this time, during this time, all parties of the transaction should pay attention uh, to ensure the accuracy accuracy of the tax declaration amount uh, otherwise uh, not only the seller will be challenged in the future but also the buyer will face the risk of being punished for uh, failing to perform the withholding obligation correctly and also the future the future transfer cost of the, of uh, its asset will be impacted and uh, underestimated um okay now uh we can uh, go to the uh, second and maybe last question uh quentin back to you okay so the, the question that we received okay, just as a sake of uh, for, for the sake of clarification we will not be able to cover all the questions that, uh, that were asked if people ask questions in the chat we'll get back to them individually and um after the webinar through through email Okay, so the other question that we received is um, what is the time frame for conducting an M&A deal in China? Okay, so the, the, how long does it take question? I will have to, I'll have to make a few assumptions in order to get back to this, otherwise I'll just have to reply it depends and it depends is not a, is not a satisfactory reply. So I'll uh, just make a few assumptions. Let's say it is a share deal with 100% asset acquisition. Um, so it's not a merger, it's not a partial acquisition, and it's not uh, it's not an asset deal. It's a share deal. The target is known, meaning you don't have to take into account the shopping shopping period. Uh, the market is found. The, mar the, the, the market the target excuse me is found. The target is identified, and the target is known. That's one. Uh, second, the price and the general structure of the acquisition will be decided, or at least has been the, the negotiation has been uh, initiated. And the third uh, assumption will have to be that the general structure of the deal is clear enough. Now. For the general uh, due diligence, meaning the legal due diligence and the financial uh, due diligence, and to allocate enough time for solving potential issues, because there will be some issues, that's for sure, uh, for the time of uh, applying to all the required applications before the Chinese authorities and to conduct all the analysis on the business, on the regulatory aspects, for initiating the licenses renewal process and uh, until the registration as uh, uh, the registration of the new shareholder as the 100% shareholder of the of the newly acquired company um, the whole process will take between 6 i would say 6 and 12 months and after that period, the company will be ready for business, and uh, the new uh, and the new buyer's uh, ownership. So that's basically the the amount of time that you have to keep in mind when considering uh, uh, acquiring a Chinese company. Uh, between six and twelve months is a good guideline. It can be conducted in a, a shorter period of time, but uh, this will have to be in very special cases where the company that we are acquiring is extremely clean, which unfortunately is not as common as we would like to think. Um, but yeah, generally speaking, it's uh, 12 months is a good, a good safety uh, time frame to have in mind in order to cover potential issues that will be uh, that will be faced. Okay, so I think this uh, concludes our presentation. Again, for future questions, we'll, uh, we will um, get back to you through email. I hope this presentation was this presentation was insightful and informative to all of you uh, attending, and uh, we will keep you posted for the next um, the next webinar, hopefully uh, very uh, anytime anytime soon. All right.
Thank you very much, and I wish you a good afternoon and a good end of the day. Thank you for joining.